to prophesy, he would have the singer sing, and then the Spirit would move upon him, and then he would prophesy. So that was something that was established in the Old Testament, that that precedent's already been established. And they had heard about it. David wrote about that in the Psalms a number of times. The relationship to the heart of worship and the flow of the Holy Spirit's ministry for healing. So Saul said to his servants, okay, provide me now with a man who can play well. Bring him to me. Go find somebody that can uh, worship and minister where evil spirits lift off of people. If you can find a man that moves in that kind of anointing, bring him to me. And one of the servants answered and said, look, I have some armor bearer. Then Saul said to Jesse, saying, please, let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. In other words, let him come live here and do this all the time, is what he's saying. And so it was that whenever that spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp, he would play it with his hand. And then Saul would become refreshed. Saul would become well, and the depressing spirit would depart from him. So he would be refreshed, he would be made whole, and the spirit of depression would lift off of him when the worship anointing that was, or that anointing of the Spirit that was on David when he would worship the Lord. That's a powerful story. First, I want to uh, point out that there are three distinct anointings that took place in David's life. And this is the first one. The first one is here in Bethlehem when he's about 17 years old. Chapter uh, 16, verse 13. It was an anointing of the Spirit to empower David to do special tasks. It was an anointing of the Spirit that, that empowered him to do special and distinct tasks in the Lord. <clears throat> New qualities uh, empowered David that he did not have before. Matter of fact, seven of them are, are, uh, are, are described here in verse 18 and 19. The same thing happened to Saul. This was a thing that was a, a well-known principle in, in Israel's history. That the Spirit of the Lord would come upon a man or a woman. Came upon Deborah. And she became judge and moved under the power of the Lord. But in chapter 10, verse 6, understanding and building that he could build with revelation. There is a Spirit of the Lord that can empower us in any task. Now the description, the sevenfold description we'll look at in verse 18 and 19, we'll look at in a few moments. Those seven qualities are new in David's life. Because he's described in these seven ways in eight, verse 18 and 19. In verse 12, before the Spirit came on him, he was described more by his appearance. Now he's described by special, distinct operation of the Spirit working in his life. Now, there was a certain time lapse between verse 13 and 14. We don't know if a year goes by, but we, we, we know David's approximately 17 years old here, and he's 30 years old in, in chapter 31. And so, you know, there has to be about 13 or 14 years, and there's certain key dates where you can ascertain it, and then there's a little guesswork. But possibly a year has gone by from the anointing of the Lord upon him in verse 13. But these new qualities are emerging, and they're very distinct uh, 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 evidences of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's no ev we, nobody knows what what it looked like when the Lord poured the uh, I mean, when Samuel poured the oil upon David. As far as we know, he stood there, and oil came on him. But the power of God, we don't know what that looked like. We just know there were these new dimensions in his life that that broke out. The second anointing came upon him. About 13 years later, that was at Hebron. At Hebron, that's in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 4. He was anointed as king at Hebron. He was anointed over one of the 12 tribes. He was 30 years old. He was over one of the 12 tribes, one twelfth of Israel. This was an anointing for government within his tribe. It was an anointing to have governmental leadership within the tribe God gave him. And then the third anointing came upon him when he was in Jerusalem. When he was 37. 2 Samuel 5, verse 3. That was for conquering all the land round about him and defeating the Lord's enemies all about. It was a land, it was an anointing to take the land in a very definitive apostolic way. It was not 
just a, a little breakout, a little victory. He conquered all the enemies of the Lord in all the spheres that God gave him. And so that, that was a, an anointing for, for conquering the Lord's enemies and going out. It was an apostolic anointing in a, in, a, in a way far superior than what was happening at Hebron. But what's happening here at Bethlehem in this first anointing of the Lord, it's to do tasks. And typically that's the first thing that happens on a man or a woman. The Lord will anoint them to speak the Word of God or to administrate or to sing the songs of the Lord or to write or to, to do, you know, a, a, a one-off deal. But the anointings I'm talking about that David received at Bethlehem was something where there was an ongoing, consistent operation of the Spirit. I don't mean it was there every minute, every day, but it was something he became accustomed to. It was something that he began to rely upon that anointing. He couldn't make it happen, but it's something that he counted on and he grew in confidence that that anointing would work. You see that in the people as they begin to, in the most graphic way, in the prophetic arena. Whether they're speaking words over people or singing prophetic songs, they kind of start off a little iffy, you know. Thus says the Lord, uh, He loves you, and there's a breakthrough coming. Yea, I inhabit the praise of my people. And, and, and it, but after a while, but it really touches people. It really does. I mean, the breakthrough really comes, and the Lord really didn't have the praise of His people. But, but they get confidence in that anointing. They begin to count on it, and then they begin to... Uh, uh, there's a boldness that comes in a period of time with experience. Now, some people begin to put their confidence in themselves in a funny way, and, and then it gets all corrupt. But there is an ongoing anointing that happened in David's life in Bethlehem that he grew in his confidence in. It was something that was distinct. It wasn't just his qualities that he was better than other people. I mean, this was a, a mighty operation of the Holy Spirit. The first thing that I want to highlight of these seven qualities, and in, I, and wait, I would say before I go to the seven, I believe they were enriched in each of the three anointings. That first to do tasks, I believe that it was stronger when he was at Hebron and stronger yet even beyond when he went to Jerusalem. I believe that it was the same kind of anointing, it just it, it had a depth to it. And obviously it increased as well. But there was a growing dimension and a depth to the things that God gave him in Bethlehem. Because you'll see these qualities, these same seven qualities, he's operating in them at the end of his life as well. And I believe that these are a picture of what God does. These are physical Old Testament anointings that have New Testament counterparts to them. Because David is clearly a picture of the, of the church. He's a picture of the bride. He's a picture of the warring church. And that's not an accident. That's very, very clear. He was given as a pattern for the New Testament church. Okay, the first thing that I want to look at is in verse, they're in verse uh, 18 and 19. Look, I have seen the son of Jesse, who is skillful in playing. It's the anointing to release the presence of God to the oppressed. That's what it is. It's not uh, just an anointing of music. It happened to be in music. But there's other folks that lay hands on people. You know, Jill Austin will go lay hands on people and the Spirit of the Lord will touch them and refresh them. And, I mean, everybody doesn't sing. Julie sings, I sing, Joanne sings. But everybody doesn't operate. Julie, don't take that personal. They weren't really laughing at you. Oh, you knew that. Okay. But it's an anointing to release the presence of the Lord to oppress people. That uh, the, uh, the uh, Lee and Doris Harms do that. They have a, 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 a distinct anointing to pray for people one-on-one. -on -one. And they've done it for years, you know, Tuesday night in the office for hours. And they've seen tremendous miracles. It's anointing to bring the presence of the Lord to people's lives. I've seen people do it uh, uh, with the ministry of deliverance. All, all kinds, whether it's singing, praying, just bringing the presence of the Lord, laying hands on them and releasing. That's what, what, that's what was happening up in Toronto. The Lord was raising up people in whom they laid hands on people and they brought the presence of the Lord to oppress people. In David's case, it was done through music, but it's, it's more than a music and anointing. It's anointing to bring the presence of God to oppressed. Now, it's interesting that this one is emphasized. It's, it's declared two times that it's developed. Verse 18 is, is when it's in the uh, list of seven here, but in verse 14 to 16, it's developed more. And we'll, let's, let's look at that verse, uh, I mean, that passage a little bit more. There's a distressing spirit from the Lord that's troubling Saul. People are always confused about that verse, and all the commentators argue about it. But I think what has happened 
is that Saul has been dabbling in witchcraft. That's what it says in, in chapter 15, verse 23. He has, in 22. Chapter 15, verse 22. He has a, he has a defiant spirit against the Lord. And when you open yourself up to a defiant spirit, I don't mean he's immature. He says no when God says yes. And he holds his ground. I mean, that, that's, that's not good. Especially when you're anointed. I believe that when you're anointed of the Lord like Saul was, and you're defiant and you're anointed, I believe it's far more grieve, uh, I mean, the consequences are far more serious to the people and to the vessel. I believe that if a prophet of the Lord anointed gets rebellious, they go into way more crazy kind of uh, dilemmas in their, in their lives. I really believe that. I believe that you can operate in the realm of the anointing and you get rebellious when you've been flowing in the realm of the Holy Spirit. It, it, I think it opens you up to a demonic counterattack and the Lord in His justice to discipline you, to bring you to repentance. It's from the Lord in the sense of the Lord permits it. He takes a step back. He, he lets the hedge go down, so to speak, like Job said, build that hedge around me. He lets there to be a gap in the hedge through the uh, act of defiant rebellion. And the, uh, this depressing spirit came upon Saul, which was a discipline of the Lord upon him in order to bring him to repentance. That's the point of it. I mean, that's, that's what the Lord's heart is in this. It's this, uh, it, was an, it was an insanity spirit would come upon him. A spirit of rage, a spirit of terror. Saul would just become paranoid in the most intensive way. That doesn't mean everybody that struggles with any of those things is in the dilemma Saul's in. Because those are, those are vast subjects. But I'm talking, and so you don't want to just assume that any struggle you have is the Lord has sent an evil spirit to you. But if you've been called out, set apart as the anointed king of a nation... And the prophet of God, you defy him a number of times, and then something suddenly comes on you, and the Spirit of God's gone, and you begin to have uh, th this torment that rests upon you, of which the, uh, the, you know, the prophet of God has described it to him, told him he was in big trouble, and the Lord rejected him. Then you can look at these verses and see what Saul did. But don't, I've seen a lot of people take that and say, that's me. I go, no, nah, I don't think you, you've qualified for that kind of oppression. <laughs> You know, it's like I love how Francis Frangipan said it. He goes, new levels, new devils. I think there's a new level of anointing that, that opens yourself up to new arenas of attack, new intensities of attack. So this idea that Saul is in great distress. I believe the seeds of witchcraft have been planted in his rebellion while being an anointed vessel. Well, I tell you, the anointing is a strange... Uh, I mean, it's a strange thing that happens in people when they get anointed. They... Some people become uh, f just absolutely fiery in gratitude towards the Lord. But there's another kind of person that gets arrogant and they get obstinate and they get rebellious because of the strength that they're so accustomed to when the Spirit of the Lord's on them. And they actually then get defiant against the Lord. I've seen it a number of times. It's, a, it's the strangest thing that that confidence that they grow accustomed to, they lose the connection that it's, it is a gift operating on them they begin to think of it as themselves, and they get real, uh, real uh, proud, uh, uh, prideful. And they normally start attacking people like, like Saul did. And it gets into crazy stuff. I just, you kind of scratch your head and think, how did they start thinking it was them? You, you, you know, if, if, if you're one of those people that you don't think it's you, you really know it's the Lord when something good happens, it kind of mystifies you when these, you see these folks that are so... Uh, accustomed to this, that they actually use it to fight all their personal battles. You look at it, you think, my goodness. And every now and then you'll run into someone like that, and, and normally if they're at a pretty high level because they got the anointing on them, and it's kind of kind of strange to see it. I'd be afraid to ever name names, but there's been a number of them in our nation that have been uh, pretty strong pictures of some pretty angry guys with the anointing on them, and some strange things happen when you operate in that kind of thing. It's a dangerous thing. It's a spirit of depression, these fits of terror and rage would come upon him. It ended up in 1 Samuel 28. He actually consults a witch to bring Samuel back from the dead, to, to, to talk to Samuel after he's died. And there's a dozen theories as to what really happened there, but my point is Saul goes full on into witchcraft before this thing is over. And it's the beginning of it right now. It's interesting that this 
this pressing spirit in verse 23 that when David uh, would minister to him, he would be refreshed, number one. He'd be made whole, number two. And the depressing spirit would lift off of him. The presence of the Lord, not just in worship, but I like it most in worship. I, but again, I've seen those, those meetings where the people have laid hands on people and you just never know what's going to happen. A spirit of refreshing comes and lifts, temporarily lifts the oppression off of them for a season. Because oppression, again, that's a big subject, but sometimes it is a defi- I mean, it's a very, very specific spirit, the spirit of heaviness, Isaiah 61, the anointing of the Lord is upon me. To take the spirit of heaviness off of people. That's what David was operating in right there. It's a very, very powerful thing. Now, it's interesting that David's reputation in verse 18, this, this uh, court servant, he's uh, been down, uh, Gibeah is about 10 miles north of uh, Bethlehem. The spirit's on David and things are starting to happen now. We'll see in a few moments. He kills the lion and the bear. I mean, the story begins to get out. When he plays the harp, for real, his people are noticing that they're going, wow, my heart is moving when you're playing. And I have no doubt that when that guy says, I have seen him, that some folks have gathered and David is beginning to speak the word of the Lord. He's growing in this anointing. Things, new uh, uh, de- uh, developments in his life in God are growing in this season in a very dramatic way. I'm going to look at next week some Psalms that I believe David wrote in this season after the Spirit came upon him and enlightened his understanding. But it's the Holy Spirit enlightening. And so this court servant says, you know, in our language, Saul, I've been to one of his concerts, and it was anointed. I mean, I was down there. It, it was awesome. I mean, I was with some of the young men, and he was playing, and man, we just got lost in God. I'm telling you, he's the guy you want. It will come off of you, this oppressive spirit. And the oppression would lift temporarily. Because when a spirit oppression... You can't uh, have it lift uh, 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 permanently through an act like that because when refreshing comes, it will lift it temporarily. You have to get to the roots that open the door for the spirit of oppression to have the thing go away in a permanent sense. But you can get temporary relief under an anointed servant. Verse 16, he's skillful on the heart. He plays it well. You will get well when he plays it. Skillful. I believe his skill because he's done it for years. It, you know, we'll call it the guitar in, 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 in our culture. Because the harp there isn't exactly the harp of today. He's playing the guitar. He plays it well, I'm sure, because he played it for those lonely hours by himself. And I'm sure he was a gifted musician, just as God uh, you know, gave him natural endowments. But the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, too. So you see the Spirit of the Lord upon someone when they're playing the piano or an instrument. It is amazing. You know, the, the, the trumpet or the flute or the violin. It's amazing when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. That's what I think that that guy observed. And he's, the, no, the, the, the testimony of David is going around about. And you don't ever have to, uh, as, as Leonard Ravenhill used to say, because you never have to advertise a fire. When the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, it, 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 the Word gets out. The Word gets out. I mean, you, we could advertise, you know, a million dollars. And Toronto had a million people come. To the church in Toronto in three years, or whatever the real number was. You know, I don't know what the, but it was an unbelievable amount of numbers in Pensacola. You don't have to advertise the fire. And the presence of the Lord is being manifest. There it is. The second trait, verse 18. We're looking at the spiritual counterpart. He was a mighty man of valor. The word valor in Webster means personal bravery. It, it also means in Webster, strength of mind or of spirit that enables one to encounter danger with firmness. I'll read that again from Webster. Valor means it's a strength of mind or spirit that enables one to encounter danger with firmness. It's a spirit of courage that comes upon the servants of the Lord. Now, Paul prayed for this this mighty man of valor, this this bravery, this spirit of bold courage in Ephesians 6.18. And when Paul, as an apostle, asked for the spirit of boldness, he wasn't talking about just, you know, a more boldness in his natural temperament. He was talking about a spirit that comes upon you that makes you bold in your heart under the anointing. That's what he talked about. When the spirit of boldness comes upon a man or a woman, they can speak the word and the power of God is moving. It's, a, it's an operation of the Holy Spirit. You can't make it happen. And in David's case, the spirit of the Lord would come upon him 
And, and that's uh, chapter 17, verse 34, when he faces Saul uh, to, to go and uh, uh, take on Goliath. He tells him in verse 34 of chapter 17, he goes, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came to take a lamb out of the flock, I went after it. I struck it. I delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I caught it by the beard. I struck it and killed it. He goes, your servant killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine would be like one of them. I mean, the power of God's on David. This, this, this was not just some, you know, like, this was not a natural operation of the Holy Spirit. This was, I, I, I mean, a natural operation of David's personality. This was an operation of the Spirit. The power of God was on David right here. The Spirit of might was on him. The Spirit of valor was upon him. In the New Testament, we call it the Spirit of boldness. I mean, I don't know if, how many of you have seen a lion in person. I, I mean, you know, I saw a lion. I've been to the zoo a few times. But I saw a real lion. I went to on a safari in East Africa. And when we went there, there's no cages. There's no iron bars. And these guys are hungry. They don't get fed. And this lion was giant. I said, oh, my goodness. We were in a car. I said, just get out of here, man. I mean, that, I mean this car looked like nothing. This thing roared. And I mean, I'm sure I'm exaggerating, but I felt like the car shook. No, I mean, he roared, and it was like, this is frightening. David's a 17-year-old young man, but the power of God's on him. He goes up, this lion takes a hold of this lamb. He goes up and takes the lion, just takes it, you know, his beard, and just stabs it and cuts his head off. and goes, out of here in the name of Jesus, you know. <laughs> he killed the lion and the bear, and he did the same thing to Goliath. There was a... There's a spirit of, of courage that we need to ask the Lord for like Paul, like Paul the Apostle did. It's a spirit of might. But we have no fear of, a, of loss. You know, someone says, well, all the people will leave. Well, the spirit of might is on your heart. You say, you know, you're not in arrogance. It's like, so? The purpose of the Lord has to be done. It doesn't negotiate consequences with men in terms of losing their approval. I'm not talking about just kind of reckless, proud things. But I'm talking about you. the cost is easy to count when the spirit of boldness is just, it's simple. It says, let's do the will of God and get on with it. That was the second anointing that was operating on David. The third anointing, it says in verse 18, he was a man of war. It's a little bit different than being having the spirit of might or valor. This valor is this courage and boldness. Being a man of war means he has this aggression in him against the enemy. It's aggressive pursuit. You know, devil come out or I'm coming in after you. One of those kind of guys. He has a warrior's heart. And again, this is a little different than, than, than being... Uh, by the way, that's not good doctrine, so don't someone's love. I forgot we're on the Internet live. That is not good doctrine. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm used to just having fun here with the folk here. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I actually got a few... Uh, People responded last week, oh, I heard your uh, deal, and i got to remember that. Yes, I did hear you. And so, uh, <laughs> it's a warrior's heart here. So what was happening with this, because he wasn't in the army yet. He has, it wasn't a part of the military. And so, being a man of war, Saul was this new military leader of the nation. And, you know, the whole nation was not unified behind Saul. I mean, a lot were saying yes, and some were saying, well, maybe, and we'll see. Because they didn't have a history of a unified army. The tribes are not unified. It hadn't really connected yet. And what David, being a man of war, he's saying, I'm 100% for Israel. I'm 100% for Saul. There's no maybe yes, maybe no. I'm in. I'm a man of war. You can count on me. I'm going to war against the enemies of the Lord. It, 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 it was more than the spirit of boldness coming on him for a moment. It was, it was this, he was grabbed by the purpose of God. God's battle was his battle. and there was, He didn't see anything else. He was a man of war. Regardless whether a special operation of the spirit was on him, he was gripped by the purpose of God. In today's uh, 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 application, I think of, I could name a number of different people. They're serving the poor night and day. They, they are gripped with the pers- purpose of God. They're, they're people of war, men and women. They're, they're, they've got the warrior heart. They, the Lord's enemies are their enemies, and that's what they live for. They're a man of war. It's, it's describing his paradigm of life. It's not t- he wasn't even in the military yet. 
He hadn't ever gone to war. It's talking about, I'm in. Saul, you can count on me. When it's time to go to war, I will be there. I won't be one of those guys, you know, checking out, you know, what the, uh, what the Monday night movie is, and then I'll tell you later. I'll check it with you later. I'm there. When the Call for wars there. I've already said yes. There's a yes in my spirit. I'm a man of war. I don't decide every time it happens. I'm in for life. That's what it's talking about here. Because again, he'd never ever, ever gone to war. No passivity at all. No kind of renegotiating at all the time. Depending on what new opportunity comes. He's in. He's in one vote held for life in David's life. He says, I'm a man of war till the end. And God wants us to be people of war in the New Testament sense. We're in this thing. No vacations. And I'm not talking about you don't take a week off. But we don't take a year or two off. I hear all these people that are burned out and taking a couple years off. Well, I'm burnt out for a while. I says, you know what? There's only two kingdoms. God's kingdom and the devil's kingdom. You take time off of God's kingdom, there's only one other power, and it's a devouring power. He's not looking and saying, you know, you've had a little tough, some disappointments didn't come to work out like you wanted to. You know what? I'm going to let you... The Satan will devour you. The only safe place is in hot pursuit. There is no neutral zone where Satan kind of looks at you with compassion and says, it has been tough, how about it? That's not how it operates. You quit pursuing the Lord, you are like on the front lines, but no weapons, and Satan devours you, he's filled with rage. Now, when people say, I, I, I'm burnt out of... Most people mean by, I'm burnt out means, I'm bored with the Lord. That's just too, that's just too nasty to say it that way. It's, it's better to say it some other way. Because in the end, our passivity is spiritually, the origin of it is spiritual. It has to do with us and Jesus. It doesn't have to do with the church, the home group, the job, the ministry. It's about our heart fascinated with the Lord or not. Because when our heart is fascinated with the Lord, the systems of ministry that you are a part of, they can be broken, they can be great, they can be bad. But when your heart is gripped, you're a man of war. But when we've lost our fascination with the Lord, we get all this new language for it. Except for, I'm bored with the Lord. That's really bottom line. We blame shift it to every other thing. I know so many preachers that are, that are bored right now. And I'm not saying that to be critical. But what I'm saying is, and they blame it on the church. The church blames it on the leaders. Leaders blame it on the church. They go, no, it's about us and Jesus as individuals. I don't care how broken every department is. The Lord's fascinating me. I'm a man of war. The Lord doesn't fascinate me. It's just like everything else doesn't quite have the zip it used to have. Because we're never going to be fascinated with the task if we're not fascinated with the person. That's really true. I, I, I mean, I, I say that strongly because I know I've been in full-time ministry 22 years and I know that what I'm telling you is the truth. I've seen the people say it's the leaders and the leaders the people and it's about us and Jesus as individuals. It truly, truly is. And I know the only way I can be a man of war is I'm fascinated with a person and I love his cause. But his cause is burdensome sometimes. Okay, the fourth uh, evidence or for, fourth uh, uh, work of the Spirit in David's life. He was prudent of speech in verse 18. He was skilled in speech by the Lord. It wasn't just that he was clever, you know, like he was a real good salesman kind of deal, you know, naturally endowed. It's more than that. There's an operation of the Holy Spirit operating in him. He spoke wise words. It says it a number of times through his life. He spoke words of wisdom. His words were weighty. He spoke gracious words. David had, in a good sense, in, in, a, in a very righteous sense, that uh, spirit of diplomacy upon him. The thing I talked about earlier when Jesus said, uh, be wise as serpent and innocent as doves, we typically focus on being innocent, but we, we don't know how to walk amongst the people of God without causing train wrecks, even in our innocence. The Lord wants innocence, but He wants a wisdom where in the, the corporate dynamic we can walk in wisdom. That doesn't mean everybody's going to be happy, but there's the kind of person that's innocent and guileless, but just train wrecks everything. There's the kind of person that's really got... Uh, wise speech, gracious, prudent speech. They're anointed of the Lord in this, but they're, you're, you question their, their, their innocence as a dove. But David had them both operating together. But what I, 
want to say is that the Lord, the reason I'm saying this is because there was a time in my ministry where the Lord spoke to me and said, your problem is you focus so much on being innocent as a dove, you need to understand what it means to be wise as a serpent. And He gave me clearly the life of David and the diplomacy, the anointing of wisdom that operated on him to move amongst the corporate people in wisdom. To handle himself wisely as a leader before the people. And the Lord spoke to me very clearly one time and says, Your problem is you don't know how to go in and go out, come in and go out before the people. You don't know how to use your gifting in a way that affects lots of people without having more collisions than there need to be. So this, that's why I have energy on this point. I know it's an operation of the grace of God in a person's life. But it's more than just gracious and wise words. It's skillful words. It's skillful speech about God Himself, about the Lord. When David spoke, when this, this court servant came down to hear him with the harp, I believe David spoke and his words had life and revelation in him. When prudent of speech is more than he could you know, keep uh, collisions from happening, I believe he spoke from the Lord with revelation. It's a very, very powerful thing. It's the, it's, uh, part of the manifestation of this is how he wrote the Psalms by the Spirit of Revelation. There was revelation operating in him, although I'm going to look at that, for, uh, that concept in a few moments. This is very unique for a 17, 18-year-old person to operate in this gift. But the net result is the, the nation, uh, he found favor with the nation because of this gift. But this is the gift of the Lord. And, of course, you can help it by spending time in the Word. But still, there is a sense in which the Lord gives the, some of this to you as a gift as we seek Him and pursue Him. Okay, the fifth. The fifth uh, 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 thing that was happening in David's life, which has a corresponding New Testament counterpart, he was handsome. We're calling it spiritual beauty. First Peter 3 calls it being adorned, adorning your life. First Peter 3, verse 4. Adorning your life with spiritual beauty by trusting in the Lord. And when there's difficulty, you give yourself to God in the difficulty instead of just lashing out at the circumstance, you adorn yourself by when all of your anxieties and troubles are consuming you, you find a way to touch the Lord in it. That's, that's the, the, uh, the corresponding element to this. You say, well, the, ho the Holy Spirit didn't make him, ha make, him, make him handsome. Well, I believe there's a sense in which the Holy Spirit does enhance, literally enhances natural beauty by the fact that a person with a bright heart, ends up with bright eyes. Verse uh, 12 here. It said, it described his characteristics in verse 12, and they were all as naturals. They said, he had bright eyes and he was good looking. A man or a woman with a bright heart, with, with a glowing heart, they really have bright eyes, which means bright countenance. Again, he was called the sweet psalmist of Israel in 2 Samuel 23.1. The sweet psalmist of Israel. It was that... Spirit of beauty because of the passionate heart. So many Psalms we'll look at, but Psalm 63 is one of the great ones. He's panting. He's longing for God. He's longing for God as, as for, for a water in a, in, a, in a thirsty land. He's longing for God. Beloved, the longing, burning heart enhances literally, e even the way that, that you look, your account and it's alive in God is something that's noticeable. But I believe that the, the, the pattern that we're to learn from his life, just this natural story, would be the first Peter, the adorning ourselves, connecting with the Lord when things go bad. It's the most natural thing in the world when things go bad, to connect with people in a negative way. When the Lord, Peter said, connect with the Lord and adorn yourself, beautify yourself in this way. The sixth thing that I want to give as an evidence of the Holy Spirit, he had this before, but I just want to emphasize this. Verse 19. I think this is profound. Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son who is with the sheep. A man anointed of God. Reputation about him is spreading everywhere. The reputation. I mean, Saul's hearing the report in the king's court. There's men in the court of the king saying, Let me tell you, this guy is courageous. He beats the lion and the bear. The power of God on him when he speaks, when he plays the instrument, play the instrument, 
And he's still with the sheep in the mundane, enjoying the Lord. That is the thing. That's one thing that's all opposite. He's saying, obviously, has operated it and still is energized as a servant in menial things. Energized as a servant in menial things. He's still energized as a servant in menial things. Well, there's a balance, of course. Because the Holy Spirit told the apostles in Acts 6, He says, I don't want you. Serving the tables. I want you in prayer and in the Word. I want you in prayer and in the Word. I don't want you doing those. There are times and seasons. But regardless what the application is, there's the ability to enjoy the Lord in the routine and the mundane and the burdensome. And that's the point I'm really talking about. Because if you're under seasons, I've, I've been in seasons like that. Where I'm under divine restrictions. Where I can't do certain things I used to do in other seasons. And the Lord doesn't want me in those seasons to lose the ability to enjoy the Lord and the mundaneness and the burdensomeness because the burden and the mundaneness is still there. But he, there are seasons where He draws me back from certain activities and seasons where He releases me to go back out into them. And so those who have been flow, but it's the ability to connect with God. Can you imagine a man with this profile being talked about at Washington, D.C. He's noised around in the country. No one's even hardly met him yet. They just come, uh, I mean, none of the famous guys. I mean, the king has is what I'm trying to say. It's just the young servants that are whispering around and coming to Bethlehem and seeing him uh, in person and bringing the report back. And the, it's being noised abroad, this, this grace of God that's on his life. And David is happy to work with the sheep. He says, well, that's where I stay connected. I can be alone that way. They don't talk back. But anyway, that's, that's slipped out. Oops, that's some of my... Still need healing. But okay. Uh, and then the seventh one. The seventh one is in verse 18. And the Lord is with him. It's an interesting phrase. I don't believe that, that that's just a summary statement of the others. I believe it's a distinct operation of the Holy Spirit upon him. I believe it's the spirit of revelation that's upon him. The Lord is with him. I believe that it is, it is in reference to the, the thing that opened up the revelation that he wrote the book of Psalms. He got that by spiritual revelation. That wasn't just he was poetic and therefore he wrote Psalms. There was an energy of the spirit letting him see the beauty of the Lord in places where nobody else could see it because he had the spirit of revelation. And we're going to look, uh, Lord willing, next week at two very powerful psalms where David, I believe in this time, under the anointing of revelation, could walk around with new eyes. These bright eyes were more than just a cheerful face. I believe he had an enlightened heart. And that's why his eyes were bright. His countenance was bright, but I believe that uh, in, a, in a secondary sense, he was illumined in his heart. He could see the Lord where others could not see the Lord. That's what makes his psalm so stunning. I mean, his... I mean, David writing, giving the redeemed community in, in the history, the book of Psalms, was a massive step forward in Revelation. I mean, we had Moses, and then to take the feeling of God's heart in Psalms and add it to, to uh, the writings of Moses was a, a significant step forward for the people of God that God let David see and feel so much directly from heaven and write it. The progressive nature of Revelation, it, it was growing. And, 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 and David really, really took a giant step in redemptive history. In the way that, that the apostles did, that Paul the Apostle did in the New Testament. I mean, he really took us, you know, a massive step forward in the book of Revelation. I mean, the book of Romans and the book of Ephesians. They were tremendous giant steps in Revelation that God gave the human race through those two uh, documents, Romans and Ephesians. David's great legacy is the giving of the book of Psalms. Turn to a chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. It's, it's the first time that the writer of Samuel, Samuel obviously didn't write it because the book is written, 1st 2nd Samuel, far after he's been, he's died long before this book was written, but they named it in honor of him because he was the first one that broke through, so to speak, in the anointing, and he's the one that anointed David and anointed Saul, so they named the book after him. 1st Samuel chapter 3. It's the first time the writer of Samuel uses the phrase, God is with him. And I believe the first time gives us some hints as to how it's to be understood. Uh, 
Okay, where am I at? Okay, verse 19. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. And the Lord let none of his words fall to the ground. That's prophetic revelation. And all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, that's from the, from the north to the south. Dan is up in the north, Beersheba is in the south. That's just a, a phrase they would use from Dan to Beersheba, from the far north to the far south. Everyone knew Samuel had been established as the prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed Himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And I believe when it says the, the Lord is with him three or four times, it references the revelation of the Lord is in his heart. God is revealing the word of the Lord to him. And it doesn't just mean about a person thing. It's that heart that's enlightened by the Holy Spirit to see God's heart. And if it's God's heart as to who, which person is to be king, or if it's God's heart where you could look at the heavens and see the glory of God, like David did in Psalm 19. Ref, uh, uh, referring to John the Baptist, it says that the Lord is with him. And when it talked about the Lord being with him, in Luke 1, verse 66, and then in, in uh, verse 77, it says to give the knowledge of salvation. Verse 79 to give the light of the knowledge of God to other people. When the Lord was with John the Baptist, it was manifest. He didn't do any miracles. The Lord was with him in that spirit of might. He didn't kill a lion or a bear, wasn't a military man, but the spirit of revelation. He brought the word of the Lord to the nation of Israel. In that sense, the Lord was with him. He gave him revelation of the Messiah who was to appear and to be manifest in the land. Let's go ahead and conclude with Psalm 27. Psalm 27, just a few little thoughts on it. The Lord is with them. I believe it's a spirit of revelation. Paul prayed Ephesians 1.17 for the spirit of revelation to touch the hearts. Ephesians 1.17, Beloved, the spirit of revelation, when God reveals God to the human heart, your heart has power in it. Your words have power in it. Life is all different. You see God different. You see yourself different. You see people different. You see circumstances different when God is revealing God to the heart. And that's what David, this is one of the great psalms of David's life. Psalm 27. It's one of the theme verse that we're looking at is verse 4. This one thing I have desired from the Lord. I have desired it in the past tense. I will seek it in the future tense. He wants what he wants all the days of his life. He wants two things. He says one, but he puts them together. He wants to dwell in the house of the Lord. It's my understanding that the house of the Lord isn't established yet. It's a vision in David's heart. Matter of fact, when uh, Nathan the prophet visited David and said, David, what do you want? He goes, I want to build the Lord's house. I, I've got a burning with desire. And Nathan said, okay. Then Nathan came back later and said, no. The Lord said, no, your son Solomon has to build it. David said, I burn to build the house of God. I, I, I long to build it more than anything. And so we know the house of the Lord was something built in the next generation by his son Solomon, Solomon's temple. David had the tabernacle. He had the little tent with the, with the, uh, the musician. He restored the musicians and all those kinds of things for some time during his life. But, but we know that there's two things. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord, which really means I want to gaze on God. It's really one thing. I want to... I have sought it, and I will seek it all the days of my life to gaze on, to delight in the, unco the discovery, the uncovering of God's beauty to my heart. That's what I want to gaze on. I want to discover it. I want to delight in it. I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. And the word behold there, put gaze, delight, discover. I'm not saying that's what the Hebrew word means. That's just how I, what I always say when I read it. So, I don't know any Hebrew, but... Gaze, delight, discover, encounter is what David is, I believe he's saying. So David wanted to do this all the days of his life. He wanted to inquire in the Lord's temple. Again, his Solomon, his son, built the temple, but David burned to build the temple, but the Lord said no to him. But look at chapter, I mean, Psalm 27, verse 1. This is, this is what uh, David's operating under. The Lord is my light and my salvation. He's the strength of my heart. I don't have fear. And I believe what David is saying, I believe he's saying more than just the generic, you know, the Lord lights my path and nobody quite knows what, exactly what you mean by that. I believe that the Lord, David, meant I have a spirit of revelation operating in my life. 
There's divine light operating in my walk with the Lord. The Lord's my light. He's unfolding things to me all the time. Again, he had to have that to be an author of Scripture. He says, it's one thing. He goes, because God's my light. He says, it strengthens my heart. He goes, it causes fear to be uh, diminished. I don't think fear is diminished just because David has confidence all the negative will be removed. That's one way fear is diminished. Because God will sometimes tell you the negative elements, God will take care of them. But one way that fear is diminished, God changes the things you want. A person that doesn't want something, a person that doesn't want anything is not afraid. We get significant. released from the spirit of fear by reducing the things we long for. And so one way, the beauty of the Lord, as it unfolds just a little bit in our hearts, it significantly diminishes, it makes shorter the list of the things we want. Because we get satisfied, then we get ravenously hungry, and then the things we wanted become obstructions and distractions, and they're time-consuming, and then one by one, we begin to lay a number of things down that are legitimate, but they are distractions. Because when the beauty of the Lord begins to shine in the heart, things that are permissible but are not edifying or not helpful, we begin to say, Lord, do you mind if I just lay that down? The Lord says, you know, I knew you'd say that. And one way we get set free from fear is by reducing, shortening the things we want real bad. Because fears are always related to things, not getting things we want. And the Lord wants us to want some things. And the Lord is telling David, I'm going to, in, your, in this intimate relationship, I, he could have confidence that the Lord would go and fight for him on certain things. But other things, David just got free from the desire of them. And again, I'm talking about even legitimate things. And the Lord is our light. Our heart grows in the Lord and it shrinks in its, in its even desire and its appetite for other things. It's, it's an amazing paradox that we shrink and grow at the same time. And in his adversity, this is how it happened. He would be in adversity in verse 7. He says, Oh Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy on me. When I would do that, he goes, you would always answer me. You would say, David, seek my face. David, you need mercy, you need help. But seek my face first and make the area you, you need help in second. And my heart would say back to God, Oh God, your face I will seek. Just don't hide it from me. Reveal it to me. Be my light. So David would get into pain. Oh God, give me, give me. And the Lord says, Seek my face first and make the give me second. Some of the give me's are from the Lord and some of the give me's the Lord wants to release. Because I want them second. He'd say, David, seek my face and my beauty. And the David said, I love that. He goes, Oh God, thy face, oh God, I will seek. Only I ask you one thing. If I'm going to go for you all the way, God, if I'm going to seek your face, number one, and things second, if I'm really going to do it, I ask for one thing. Don't hide your face. Don't hide it from me. And the Lord says, I won't. I'll give it to you. But I want to realign you. Every time your heart gets troubled, I want that trouble to realign you with, with understanding as to what you're about. You're about me unfolding my beauty to you, David. That's what you're about. That's what I called you to. I called you for myself. I called you because I like you. I called you to like me. And I called you to let people know about liking me and me liking you. I want you to know my beauty, David. And I want you to seek my face. I want you interacting with it all the time. And so the Lord would allow bruises and pains to come into David's life. And the Lord always whispered back, seek my face first. Now there's a, a phrase, and, and uh, I'm going to end it. No, I guess i got one more thought to make here. I've forgot here, look down here, but uh, a phrase I want to hit, then I want to read Psalm 78, just verse 70. Just go ahead, there's Psalm 78, verse 70, we're going to end with that verse. Because I'm going to pray it over you. But there's, there's a, a phrase, I just want to take a shot at it. Sounds real good, but it's, it's not. It's, people say it, it's, I mean, you hear it all the time, I've said it lots of times, so I, I'm a part of the problem. It's people say, the Lord wants you to seek His face, not His hand. That's not right. The Lord wants you to seek His face and His hand just in the right order. He doesn't want you to turn His hand away. He wants you to seek His face first and His hand second. Not one versus the other. You don't have to choose who you like best, the Father or the Son. You can have them both. 
God wants you to seek His face and He wants to release His hand to you. I've heard people say that for years. We seek the giver, not the gifts. Wrong. The Bible says very clearly, seek the gifts. You seek them second. You seek the giver first, and then you seek the gifts second. You don't do one or the other. You don't do either or. You do both and. You just do them in the right uh, sequence, and you have divine order in your life. So I just wanted to say that. I've said that for years, but it just isn't biblical. Sounds good, though. Okay, Psalm 78. About David. It's the three steps on the anointing of God on David's life. Verse 70. God chose David his servant. And the Lord took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes that had young, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. And he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with skillful hands. Here's the point, three steps. Number one, God chooses he chooses. The calling comes suddenly. In David's life, he's out working in the field. There's a bunch of guys up having a you know, fellowship dinner with a famous prophet. He's out there down with the sheep or mowing the lawn in our language. He looks up and waves at him as they're all eating dinner and having fun. And the word of the Lord is about to change his life. And he doesn't even know a minute beforehand when, when they say, come up here. He doesn't even know that his whole life is about to change. When it comes, beloved, it comes suddenly, the, the uh, call of the Lord does. I could tell you stories, men and women that I know, some are 15, some are 65, where the word of the Lord comes to them and they thought they were the last person on the earth to receive the call the Lord chose. The call comes forth. The call comes suddenly. You're in the midst of the mundane. You're in the midst of the sheep. The call comes suddenly when it comes. Samuel made that astonishing visit to Bethlehem and this kid out with the sheep suddenly is called. I mean, it's awesome when it comes. You don't know the day before it's coming. You don't know what's happening tomorrow. John Arnott said, we had no idea. He goes, yeah, a few guys said it, but you know. We're going to have 500,000 people visit us in three years. Are you kidding? Or whatever the numbers are. He goes, there's no way it came suddenly one day. The word came. Actually, they had a prophet that announced it. Mark DuPont for, uh, for a, a full year he announced it. A number of people told me about it. So the call comes suddenly. The Lord chooses, or put, so put the word, He calls you. He communicates something about the future. Then the next thing is that He takes you from the sheepfolds. That's different. He calls you, and sometimes years go by. Then He takes you. This is He trains you. Put the word trains. In David's life, it was 20 years, from age 17 to 37. He called him at 17. For 20 years he trained him. He was taking him from the sheepfold for 20 years, in essence. He was taking him out of his former way, his former occupation, into a new occupation. He was training him. And beloved, there's many, many difficult uh, turns in, in, uh, in the stream, so to speak. That river has many turns to it. And thirdly, he brought him. God brought him, or he put him, as shepherd over the inheritance of God. That's the divine commissioning. That's when the release of the full promise, the full earthly promise. So God starts by choosing. That comes in a moment. The calling comes suddenly. You don't even know it's coming until it comes. That's the nature of it. The taking or the training takes time. The being brought, or put the word, the Lord puts you into the place, the main place that He called you to. And normally He'll put you in a couple places before He puts you and the place that He gave you the main call for, that's the commissioning. He calls you, He trains you, then He commissions you. Don't confuse the commissioning with the calling. A lot of folks get the calling and they want to go sell their house and go buy a U-Haul and start traveling. No, no. The call and the commission are totally different. There's this little time frame in David's life of 20 years where he uh, went through the school of, of the Spirit and uh, for uh, about... Uh, you know, seven or eight years of it, he was under the, he was under the uh, professor Saul, a demonized king, was his seminary teacher. You see, it's one thing to be under a demonized guy, but a demonized king, a king has an army and a lot of money. You know, that, that's way worse if he's a king. Amen. Let's stand. Well, one more thing. When you're commissioned, no, no, stand. But when you're commissioned, the hardships... Continue. Paul had far more hardships 
in his commissioning as an apostle when the power was on him than he did beforehand. So it's not like the hardship starts when the commissioning starts. The hardship begins then. New levels, new devils. It's really true. Let's come before the Lord. Oh, Lord, we want to be yours. Oh, God, we want to seek your face all the days of our life. God, I want you to be my light. Oh, God, be with me. We want the spirit of revelation upon our hearts. Beloved, I challenge you to give yourself to the Lord in the quiet place. I challenge you to. The Lord wants to be your life if you'll give Him room. You give the Lord ten minutes a week and ask Him to be the light. He says, no, I, I, you're not much is going to get in in ten minutes. Make some time. Wait on the Lord. Throw a little prayer and fasting in. Make the Lord your magnificent obsession. He will be light in your heart. The beauty will unfold. The face He tells you to seek, He only tells you to seek it because He plans to unveil it to you. God never tells you to seek His face except He's going to reveal it to you. David said, don't hide your face. The Lord says, I wouldn't have told you to seek it if I was going to hide it. It's implied by the commission of the infinitely good God. Lord, we want the Spirit of the Lord to be with us. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.